Ready, Greg? Let's go, Jay. You're listening to The Success Paradigm with your hosts, Jay Atkins and Greg Gray. All right. Welcome all. We are here with Mr. Paul Clark. So this is going to be a special, special treat. Uh, So I'm going to do the official bio because this is our thing here now. I do official bio and then Jay, after sipping coffee, does the more unofficial bio. So, um, but wow, what a bio to read. So Paul Clark. Paul Clark currently serves as the president and CEO of PBC Loan, which specializes in mergers and acquisition transactions for service sector businesses, including Allstate Insurance, Ameriprise Advisory, Farmers Insurance, and Independent Investment Advisors. Under his leadership, loans outstanding have more than doubled to over $500 million. Paul has personally reviewed and signed off. I had to read this twice because I thought I was misreading it. Paul has personally reviewed and signed off on every credit application PPC loan has funded since 2000, which accounts for over 3,000 loans totaling, get this, almost $2 billion in fundings. Paul has written and published over 75 articles in his rec- articles and is regularly asked to speak at various professional meetings. Wonder why that is. Uh, Paul created the Allstate Agency Value Index in 2009, a tool that has been used by Allstate Insurance Management, along with buyers and sellers alike, to assist in placing a fair and equitable value on an Allstate agency. With over 5,000 subscribers to the quarterly AAVI report, Paul is regularly asked to speak on agency valuation and has traveled to all uh, 13, four, uh, actually 13 Allstate designated re- regions for speaking engagements. Paul graduated from Texas A&M University with a BBA in finance and joined PPC Loan in 1999. He currently resides in the Woodlands, Texas, in Woodlands, in the Woodlands. It is the Woodlands, right? It's not yes. Woodlands. It is the, the Woodlands. Woodlands. I bet that's come up before. The Woodlands, Texas with his wife, Katie, and sons, Ryan and William. Paul spends his free time coaching his son's sports teams, fishing, playing golf, and attending church functions. So we are super excited to have you here, Mr. Paul Clark. Thank you for being here. So, Paul. And here we go. Well, since Greg gave the play-by-play to our listeners already, letting them know what we're doing, like they wouldn't be able to figure it out, um, I'm going to go ahead and give you the unofficial bio. And I, I do this on people that I know really well, and and usually for people that have changed my life. And Paul, you're one of those people. And that's why I invited you on here today because um, you're a big part of where I am, where, why I am where I am, because uh, you took a chance. Um, you gave me lots of guidance uh, through the process of me wanting to grow um, in the Allstate and the insurance world. And you're just a really, really smart individual. And you're a really good golfer too. You didn't put that in there. Um, <laughs> I, I, w- I want to tell a quick story. The first time I met Paul I was buying my first agency, flew to North Carolina. And you're like, yeah, let's go play golf. And I was like, I'm not that good. And you're like, I'm not that good either. And uh, you rented a set of clubs and I think you played four under on the course you never played on before. So I was like, Paul, you say you don't play golf that often, um, but uh, you shot four under. You're like, ah, oh, no, nah, it was luck. It was luck. But anyways, um, I, I, you know, I've got to spend a lot of time with you. I tell us a lot of stories of things that I've learned from you. Um, recently, a, a story on the golf course uh, when there was a pro out there, CP Span, and he was on the driving range uh, when we went out there early in the morning. And when we made the turn, he was in the same spot, hitting the same club with a bunch of balls around the same flag. We came back around, finished 18, went and had lunch. He was still there. And I asked you a question and you made me feel kind of dumb. When I asked, I said, doesn't he ever play the course? And you're like, when he gets paid. And I was like, yeah, but but doesn't he enjoy playing the course? And he was like, well, do you see how many balls are on that flag out there? Do you think he could hit that many balls playing 18 holes of golf? And I was like, hmm, I never really thought about that. But anyways, also, Paul, you are a great father, um, a great mentor to many, and just a really smart individual that I cannot wait to interview today and ask some questions because I know you well, but I don't think I know you as well as I should. So 
Speaking of, uh, a lot of people in the insurance and finance world know you to be what I just described, but they see your glory and they see your brain, they see your smarts and your ability to get deals done. But I don't think most of them know what the story is and how you got where you got and got the chance to run this company and become a president and owner of the company. And I'd like to kind of rewind the tape for people that are listening to this call in the future and today to hear from you what your life was like when you were young at Texas A&M or even before and what kind of sculpted and shaped you and what kind of failures you had along the way to make Paul Clark, who I've come to know as a very, very int intelligent individual. Thank you, Jay. Well, first of all, every time you talk about me, it's kind of embarrassing, honestly. <laughs> um, I just, I love hearing you talking, but uh, I really, really appreciate it. To me, this is a big deal, guys, For uh, and kudos to, to, to Greg for the intro there. Um, you know, I, I don't often get invited to do stuff like this. At best, I get invited to have a couple beers with some guys in the neighborhood at the cul-de-sac. So to be able to actually come share my story is, is um, something that really means a lot to me. So I hope you guys know that. Hopefully, we'll be able to share a lot of stuff together by the end of this. But I think for, for, for you and the audience to really understand my story, I kind of need to go way back um, to the childhood. And when I think about my childhood and kind of my life growing up, I really think about four areas, um, family, friends, sports, and school. And I'll start with, with family. Um, you know, growing up, I had the best parents. And that's not just me saying that. All my friends love coming over. Everybody would say, Paul, you have the best mom. Paul, you have the best dad. I really have the best parents. Um, growing up, uh, we had a lot of fun. We went on vacations. I remember laughing a lot. Um, I remember the bar was always set very high, but the bar was always set, set very high on not results, but effort. Um, that was the key thing, especially with my mom. I always had to have the effort. And I have a sister, younger sister, four years younger than me. She's an executive at a, a, a oil and gas firm in Houston. She's made her way up the rung. She's way smarter than me and a very successful individual who I keep in contact with very, very often. But my parents are amazing. They still live in the same house. As far as my childhood goes and my family, I would give it an absolute A+. Plus. Um, fantastic, fantastic grounding there. Uh, my friends, I didn't have a lot of friends growing up, but the ones that I had were fantastic friends. Uh, typical 80s kid. Uh, riding the bike all over the neighborhood, you know, out when the sun goes up. I don't know how we found food. Um, probably ate at somebody's house and then came home when it got dark or we could hear my dad's whistle in the neighborhood. He had the best whistle. I can't whistle at all. Um, so, you know, friends, fantastic. We didn't do anything too stupid. Nobody got arrested. We did some stupid stuff. Um, I love my friends. Uh, we had a great time growing up. It was, it was the best time to grow up. I mean, we had just enough technology but not too much like kids today do. You know, back then you could call the movie theater and figure out the times, but um, you didn't have people taking videos and pictures of all the dumb things you did. So it was, to me, it was the best time ever to grow up. Uh, so friends, you know, very high passing grade there. Um, and then the third was sports. So to me, I just love sports. Um, I was always good at sports. I don't think I shot 400 that day. Maybe it was like 200 J, but <laughs> <laughs> Jay always wants me to play the ladies tees with him. I don't know what that's all about. So it's a lot easier for me to score really low from the way up tee box. So a little context there. I don't usually shoot two under, but with Jay, I can, because he wants to play the ladies tees. Um, but not sports true. for me, not true. Not true. <laughs> but sports for me, um, that was my darling growing up. I played baseball all the way into high school. I played tennis. I played everything. Um, I didn't play golf until I went to college, but um, I played basketball. I played a lot of sports and I was always outside trying to get games going and whatnot. So to me, sports was, I mean, that was a huge chunk of my life. I mean, a lot of my memories growing up, I think about high school tennis, baseball, all those things. It was just, I just loved it. And I think for me, you know, my competitive spirit came out of sports. Um, you know, I've told people I'll listen to your argument that you're as competitive as me, but I'm not interested in hearing you try to articulate that you're more competitive than me. I don't believe that exists. It's me personally, especially in the sports arena. Um, I love competing. A funny story, my mom has some of the pictures and next time I go over to her house, maybe Thanksgiving or something, I'll pull them out. But 
when she signed me up when I was like six or seven years old to play tennis. And back then you did it through the neighborhood. So you would represent your neighborhood, you'd play other neighborhoods in the area and you'd play tennis team. And I remember telling her, I think there was a close match. Maybe I won, maybe I lost, but I was like, I needed to dive for some of the balls in that match, but I, I didn't want to scrape up my knees. And she was like, well, I could, none of the other kids have it, but I could buy you knee pads and you could play tennis and knee pads. And I was like, yeah, give me knee pads. So I would dive during the tennis matches, you know, to get balls. I would dive all the time. And people, people ridiculed me. Like that was a big thing. People would call me knee pads. Uh, teammates on my own team would call me knee pads, other teams, but I didn't care. Cause I was like, if I could win one more point by diving and not tearing up my knees, then it was totally worth it to me. So um, sports to me was a huge thing growing up. And I think it really shaped, you know, a lot of, of who I am today, especially the competitiveness thing. I just really hate to lose. That's why I, I like playing golf with Jay. Um, <laughs> and then school. Technical about that. No, I just sure. bought the. I've never had ear ear pods before, so I just bought them. They fell out. It was, uh, it was a nice dramatic pause after. That's why you like to play Jay, anyway. So it, yeah, I know. Let let everybody that. soak on that for yes, a minute, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absorb fully absorb it. <laughs> this is the good thing about this podcast that I'm already. Into yeah. Lots of shit talking going on. I <laughs> love shit talking. I talk so much shit to Greg Gray all the time. So the fact that you're on this call, Paul, is going to be an awesome podcast. Oh, we're only 12 minutes in, baby. <laughs> it ain't, it ain't <laughs> even over yet. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so school. So I don't remember a lot about going to school growing up, but my first memories of school were junior high. And going into junior high, I remember taking kind of a basic – you know, just competency test and I failed. And my mom was able to get me to retake it and I failed again. And I had to take, reme I still remember remedial English in junior high. And it really was, it was tough for me. I remember tears and just having to be, you know, in the class with, with the dumb kids, you know, kind of the losers, the people who didn't know really how to write and read. And it was tough. And then, um, you know, school was a, was a struggle for years. And, you know, um, it's probably a good time for me to do a timeout on my story and talk about my oldest son. Um, he's 15. So years ago, he was diagnosed as dyslexic, dysgraphia, ADHD. And um, he's handled it well. You know, we didn't put him on medication. He's really fought through it. And when I look at him, I see me, you know, my wife's like, you're probably, you definitely, at, at, at worst, you're an undiagnosed dyslexic, you know, and those other things. And when I look at him, I see myself, um, but I see somebody, you know, sometimes you see somebody who reminds you of yourself, but you're like, man, that's an even better version of me. And I just see his interactions with people. You know, I was really shy. I didn't like talking to people at 15. He's, he's a little more outgoing than me. I was a hard worker, but he's really a hard worker. You know, he's got a golf ball selling business. He's made like 7,500 bucks in the last 15 months selling golf balls. He wow. pulls them out of the water. He cleans them. He packages them. He sells them to people all over the country, Wisconsin, local. Um, and so, you know, seeing my son and what he's had to go through with school and the struggles um, has really made me realize that the struggles I had as a kid, you know, I just always thought, I was somebody who was dumb at school. But what I realized is there's worldly smart and then there's like traditional school book smart. And just because you're not good at traditional book smart spelling, you know, all those things that teachers get excited about kids that are good at doesn't mean you can't be successful. And um, just so proud of my son watching him grow up and how he's handled it. And uh, it's just been a real blessing for me to see, um, you know, a reflection of who I am through him and to understand why my school struggles were what they were. And so I can even coach him on what he's going through, um, you know, because uh, and Jay, you might want to write this down. The one the one I, I didn't bring any notes to this, but the one thing I wrote down ahead of time was struggle is the only mandatory ingredient for success. Hmm. And I know for me, school 
was a huge struggle. Everything else was fantastic. I had the best parents. We didn't have a lot of money. We had enough, right? I had a great sister. My friends were good. I was great at sports. But there was just, I always had to build ways to be successful at school. So back to me. So, you know, I get through junior high. I go into high school and struggles continue. And I am a guy who likes to be very efficient. I've always been very efficient. And so I would go to my teachers and I would say, I want to understand the grading process. We have a project. How much is that worth? Oh, that's worth 20% of our grade. How much is the final? That's worth 20% of our grade. Tests are 10%, quizzes are 5%. So I would build a formula and I would know what I needed to get on each to make a certain grade. And the big thing I would do is at the end of the year, when finals came, I would say, okay, I'd use my mathematical formula. And I would say, okay, if I get a 94 on this test, I can get a B. But if I get a 42, I can keep my C. And then I would make a business decision. I would say, look, I can't make a 94 on this final. There's no way. So I'm going to focus on something else. I'm going to take the C. I know I can get at least a 40, you know, without studying. And so those were the type of things, uh, you know, that I did to make sure that I accomplished my goal, which was to, you know, graduate from high school and go on to college. So I really had two worlds going on at the same time. I don't know if you guys know that, that, uh, country song, Boy Named Sue. Mm-hmm. You know that song? Yeah, Boy yeah. Named Sue. Mm-hmm. When, I was, when I was doing schoolwork, I felt like Boy Named Sue. When I was doing sports, I felt like Babe Ruth. It was wow. two totally different worlds. And in the sports, I could just show up, right? Now, I like to practice, so I practice. But like school, schoolwork, it was real work. Like that was tough. And a lot of my friends, they would just show up and they would just get good grades and it was easy. And I didn't know why it was hard for me. You know, my mom would say, well, you're smart. And we tell Ryan he's smart. And I had never taken an IQ test before. So I took one this morning just because I was like, well, I want to know. I'm going to be talking about all this stuff. (laughs) So I scored 125. I was pretty happy with that. So I'm worldly at least uh, slightly above average intelligence, but the traditional school stuff. And I joke about the spelling, but... You know, when I write articles, and Jay knows I write these articles every quarter for the value index and a lot of stuff, um, there's often times when I'm writing articles where my ability to get the word I'm trying to say, even close enough for spell check to get it, I'm I'm like, so far a spell check check can't even give me, like, I can't even remember what the word was the other day, like envelope or something. And Jamie, my assistant, she sits next to me. And I'm like, Jamie, how do you spell envelope? Envelope. Cause I can't get, I can't get spelled to tell me how to spell envelope. And she's like, O N V L O P or however you spell envelope. I don't know how you spell envelope. (laughs) And uh, you know, so that was, that was my life, you know, and it goes back to um, the struggle, you know, and I, and, and going back to the kids and I know a lot of people watching this probably have kids. I don't spend a lot of time trying to take struggle or hardship out of my kids' lives. I want them to experience that to the fullest. And so, you know, even with my younger kid, like he's really good at golf. He's a little better at school. He's not great at school, but sometimes I'm like, man, he could use a little more hardship in his life. You know, I think that'd be good for him. You know, so he loses a golf tournament disappointing. It's actually good. You know, I still pat him on the back. You did your best. Wish you'd have won. Um, But anyways, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, Jay, the world is run by C students. You know, <laughs> what a way to bring that around full circle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's a lot of people right now that are breathing a deep sigh right now, Paul. They're like, all right. So yeah. you're saying I got a chance. So you're saying I got a chance. Exactly. <laughs> so, so to expand on the high school thing and then I'll move on, mm-hmm. you know, I really developed a good sense of urgency because for me, every point mattered. You know, I want, I still wanted to get good grades. I ended up graduating in the third quarter of my high school class, which I don't think anybody would guess that, right? Third quarter of high school. It's like, I was like hoping more people would drop out the bottom, (laughs) move me up, you know? Um, Third quarter. Right. But I developed a great sense of urgency, right? Because I didn't have any room to spare. I didn't have any slip around the cup, right? So I couldn't show up in class without my textbook because the teacher would take off five points. 
or if there was, I couldn't turn an assignment in late because I couldn't afford the deduction. Or if there was a, a bonus that you could do for plus five points, I, I always did it every time, every time. Um, and then, you know, the mathematical calculations, what are the chances that I could possibly squeak out a B in this class? Now, the only exception was math. I could get A's all day long in math. Everything else was tough. History, English, all that stuff. Um, I don't know what I graduated with from high school, but I mean, I did go to a really good high school. I mean, Cypress Creek High School in Northwest Houston at the time was a pretty tough school, but still third quarter. Um, and then, you know, graduating from high school, I graduated, yay, big deal. I really wanted to go to Texas A&M University and didn't get in. So I went to Southwest Texas State University for a year. It was a fantastic school, small school, San Marcos. And I go to my first class and it's English, Ugh, English, right? And the professor, you know, they're like, they're going to come in and show us not nose freshmen what college is all about. So they're like, get out a piece of paper, get out a pen. You got 15 minutes, write a paper about such and such, turn in and get out of here, come back in two hours and pick it up. I'll have them graded. So I'm like, okay. So I write my paper, I turn it in. I go back to the professor's office later. I pick it up. He goes, you got F minus. I'm like, okay. So he's like, I, you're going to have to come back mandatory tutoring or I'm going to fail you. And I'm like, okay. And I knew that I needed to get a 3.0 to transfer to A&M like that. I had to do it. So I'm like, okay. So I come back later. I do the tutoring. He goes, young man, do you even know what a subject and a predicate is? And it was like dead silence. And I'm like, I think I know what a subject is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's pretty much how my school went. Um, I found a history teacher that uh, would give a lecture. And if you could write down all of his notes fast enough and memorize them, you would, if you could regurgitate it on the test, you get an A. So I took that class twice, fall, spring. And every Sunday I would go to the library. I would sit outside the library 15 minutes before it opened at noon. And I would go find a quiet room and I would try and memorize the notes in eight hours. And then it closed at eight o'clock, the library on Sunday night. I'd, it would close at eight. And then I would wake up in the morning and I would study and I would try and memorize. And it'd be like six, seven pages of notes. And I'm trying to memorize every word. And I would go take the test and then I would have my notes. And as soon as he say notes away, I put my notes away. And then I try and write everything down <laughs> real fast. And I got an A. I got an A in that class and I took it twice. I got an A. I took math. I got an A. And I got my, I got my 3.0. I transferred AM. and I loved AM. and um, You know, I had a lot of jobs along the way, and I know that a lot of this needs to be business related. I'm really boring into my personal story here. So, no. if y'all need to move me in a di different nope. direction, feel nope. free. Your but, path. Um, I worked at Taco Bell. I had a lawn business. I worked at a computer lab at college A and M. That was a fun job. I did a lot of stuff. Um, you know, my parents were gracious enough to pay for college, but they didn't give me any beer money. So <laughs> I still had to work. Um, as I moved towards graduation and I'm moving here pretty quick, I determined a couple of things. Number one, I knew I wanted to work for myself, right? Cause I'm like, what are the odds that somebody who's employing me is going to really appreciate my efforts over a long period of time. So I need to work for myself eventually. And I decided that I wasn't going to care how much money I made in my 20s. Didn't matter. All I cared about was I wanted to make a bunch of money in my 30s and 40s, right? So I graduate from A&M December 1998. And uh, we have a great career center at A&M. At the time, it was known as the best career center in the country. They would give, they had people that would teach you how to interview they would help you sharpen your resume. They would actually line up interviews for you and set times and the, the uh, companies would come on campus and you could go through the inter interview process. So I did as many interviews as I could. I sent it for every interview and I would get into the interview and people would be like, you're kind of intriguing. And then they would ask the question at the end. So what was your GPA? It wasn't on your resume. And I would have to tell them 2.35. <laughs> And then they're like, we'll let you know. And some of them would be like, we can't hire anybody with a 2.35. So I graduated with one offer. 
and it was to sell insurance. And this guy had given me like a 200 page questionnaire, you know, personality test thing. And he kept calling me. He's like, you're perfect for insurance. You're going to kill it. You were born to sell insurance. I want you on board. And I can't remember what it was, $40,000, $45,000. I was like, I don't know. I don't really. I was kind of in the, the mold of I really want to take a first job that I think I can really take somewhere. And so I didn't take it. And then March 1999 rolled around. I'd been lived with my parents for a couple of years. And I see an ad in the Houston Chronicle. And it was for PPC Loan, where I am now. And they were looking to hire a loan analyst. I think their first, they were looking to hire their first loan analyst. So I go to the interview. The interview goes great. They didn't ask me about my GPA. <laughs> and they sent me an offer for $28,000. And I was like, hell yeah. I told my dad, I said, these guys got a good business model. They've only been open six months. They're really modest. They just want to do like $20 million a year in dental loans. I'm like, these guys are old. I could possibly own this thing one day. And he's like, well, go for it. I mean, what do you have to lose? I'm like, heck yeah, I'm going to live at home. I'm going to make 28 grand. I'm going to spend six grand. I'm going to put 22,000 in the bank. That's exactly what I did. I spent $6,000. Um, and so first day, first day of work, I show up at 6.30 a.m. I was so excited. And nobody got there till nine. I was locked out for two and a half hours. I sat in the hall. <laughs> I was in the hall. But I stuck true um, to my original goal, which was work for a small company, eventually own your own business and don't care about how much money you make. Cause it's, I really want to learn as much as I can for me. And those guys were both well-established long-term bankers. So when I got in there, I decided I wanted to learn every role in the office and be proficient as it, at it as I could. So we had a receptionist. She hated answering the phone. That was her number one job. She hated answering the phone. So I answered about 90% of the calls every day. For PPC loan, this is Paul. How can I help you? Every day. She didn't like making new deal files because we do deals. We do loans, right? She hated doing those. So I would pull credit. I would do all the background checks on the individuals. I still remember my login for Experian Credit. EICI001648. That was my login for Experian Credit doing wow. somebody else's job. I learned the closing process. I could do everything. After about nine months, I went to the owners of the company and said, I'd really like to see how we're spending our money. And they're like, well, we're not gonna show you a whole income statement, but we'll kind of let you see our marketing budget. I'm like, great, let me see the marketing budget. So I started developing plans for how could we reach out more to referral sources? Cause at then, back then, all, every deal we got was referral based. And I was really focused on, um, how can I make this business better for those guys? I didn't care. I honestly didn't care how much money I made. I really didn't. Now they recognize that and they paid me a lot of money. They don't know this, but they didn't have to. Mm -hmm. I would have kept working for $28,000 for an extended period of time because I loved what I was doing. It was a great fit for me personally. Um, they gave me a lot of freedom right out of the gate to do things the way I wanted to do them and to expand the business. Um, so, I loved it. And I know, Jay, you said you wanted me to move into m some mistakes at some point here. How am I doing? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, along the journey, man, the, the mistakes, you okay. can talk about the story. And then I would love to hear like some of the, the mistakes that you made along the way. Okay. That, that, that shaped you um, into where you are now. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so I'm, I'm close. So, so I joined the company in 98, 99. Uh, 2000 Allstate falls in our lap. I took the first ever Allstate call. Somebody called our office like, do you guys do Allstate financing? I'm like, I think we do. I think we do. We didn't have a program. I didn't even know what a CSRP or any of that stuff was, right? So I'm like, why don't you send me some information? The owners were both out of the, out of the, out of the, out of the office in Florida having a vacation together. And uh, I call them up. I'm like, I think we got something. I think we got something. So we push Allstate forward. Fast forward to 2008. Um, they had a silent partner that helped fund the business, but he was only staying on for 10 years. So they said, look, we're considering bringing on a partner um, in January 1st, 2009. I said, I'd love to do it. And I'd like as much ownership as you'll allow me to have. And they said, how about 20%? I said, perfect. Let's go. So the company had been open for 10 years. Um, 
the first day I walked in the office, I was a totally different person. Like as soon as I was an owner, it was just like, let's go. I was so excited. I think I dressed up the first day for the first time. This is about as dressed up as I get. Um, I was so excited. Within 24 months, we um, double profit. Profit double within 24 months of what they had grown in 10 years. Um, we continued to grow year after year after that. So 2009 was massive increase. 2010 was huge increase. 2011. And then as we were going along 11, 12, 13, at the time we were doing dental loans. And this is my big mistake here, Jay, segueing into it. We were doing dental loans. We were doing all state loans. All state loans was predominantly what we were doing. And I was pushing for us to dump dental, focus on all state only, and not really look at any other lending opportunities out there. We're going to be all state only. We're going to, we're going to go all in on all state. And my partners were like, look, cash register is ringing like crazy. Um, whatever Clark says, let's just go for it. And uh, all of a sudden, Allstate says, you know what? We're not going to do any more mergers. And we really don't like existing agents buying other books. And there's more competition and Allstate finance and et cetera, et cetera. And we went from doing $120 million a year lo in loans to $60 million a year in loans, which that in and of itself seems pretty bad. Then the rates dropped and we lost about half our portfolio in 24 months. Most of our customers do 10 year loans. So they typically stay on for like seven or eight years, right? Mm -hmm. We lost half of our business in 24 months and we were hardly booking any new loans. So like everything I had built, everything that looked so awesome, right? It's like, way to go, Paul, disappears in 24 months. So I'm like, crap. So that was a big mistake, right? Because what did what did we do? We put all our eggs in one basket. Right. And it reminds me of a presentation I did maybe five years ago. Jay, you may remember doing this. I did a project for Mega Agency Conference. I, I was concerned about the group because so many of the guys had too much of their net worth vested in their Allstate agency. So I sent out a questionnaire. I'm like, tell me how much cash you have, what your business is worth, how much debt you have on your business, what's your house worth, how much debt you have in your house. Tell me about your boat. Tell me about your plane. I want to know everything. And I'm going to give you guys some feedback. And on average for the mega agency conference, 55% of net worths were tied up in their all state agency. Now I don't know. And this is high net worth individuals, right? I don't know about you, but if I had $10 million, I wouldn't put 5.5 million of it into a single stock in the stock market. Right. Nobody would do that. And so it was t like, it was time for, I had preached to the mega agents years before, but I didn't do anything about it. It was time to diversify the business. And so I, we got to work on expanding into other niches. Um, I think the big thing here is, you know, you can't have all, all your eggs in one basket. You know, you have to be diversified. You have to have mul multiple sources of income. There's a lot of people who just have a job, right? They just have a job. They have one source of income. They don't have the capital resources to expand into other sources of revenue. But everybody who's a mega agent does. Most people who own an Allstate agent do. I did. Why wasn't I doing it? Mm. That was my error, right? And I, ri I put at risk because I take very seriously the responsibility to employ people that work at my office because we have exceptional people. I take very serious the um, responsibility that I have to provide them gainsful employment that challenges them and that pays them well. And to have to lay a couple people off was very personally painful to me because I had made a bad decision on their behalf. It affected their ability to provide for their families and whatnot. And I said, well, this is never going to happen again. And so we have expanded nicely into multiple niches. We now have more sources of funding. We're in a very good spot right now. Um, we want to continue to expand. But for me, for me, that was probably my biggest, my biggest mistake. I'm thankful that it's not a personal, personal mistake. I would rather have a big mistake be on the business side if I had to choose. Um, so that's. I think that's my story there, Jay. That's, that's so, pretty. Okay, go ahead, Greg. 
No, I was going to say I there. Well, there were three or four things that popped out at me, but um, they all kind of uh, slid to the side with what you just said last, which is um, if you're going to have a big personal mis- if you're going to have a big mistake, you are glad that it happened on the business side and not the personal side. And I just find that interesting because uh, I don't know that that's. I think in our heart of hearts, most people kind of believe that, but I think especially depending on how they're doing economically, they would, (laughs) well, if my wife doesn't speak to me for five or six months, that's fine. As long as I don't have to give the car back, you know, Uh, but that is a little bit of a variation on the theme of um, where I'm hoping that some of this conversation is going to go because there is a, these are drilled down and I can see it in Jay's pixelated eyes right now that uh, he's drilling. He wants to drill down, too. So I, I've got a couple queued up, Jay. So I'm going to you take it and I'm going to I'm going to see whether you're going some of the same places I'm going. Well, no, I mean, my my question and, you know, I I, I really like spending time with you, Paul. But now I, I understand why after hearing the beginning of your story, because brother, we, I mean, we had the same upbringing. Like, it's crazy. Like, I mean, all the stuff that you described, I thought I was the only one that was outside when the sun came up, street lights, whistle. Like all of those things, I just thought that that was, that was just me when I grew up. And, you know, I visualize you. I was always the kid, no matter what season it was. If it was baseball season, I had a glove and a ball in my hand. Right. If it was football season, I had a football under my arm. If it was basketball, I had a basketball. And I was always the one in the neighborhood striking up games you know, basketball games, baseball games, you know, football games, whatever it was. So it's just crazy to hear that that, cause I'm super competitive and can understand that. But to your mistake, I guess what I'm interested in kind of delving down in that, like, how is that going to shape you? And and again, I know you guys got an Ameriprise. I know you guys are, are dealing with different things now, but you know, how did that mistake you think is going to shape you over the next 10 years? Because, you know, when I hear you tell that story about you know, I was on this run and one, I would have never known. Um, and I, I knew you then we, we had conversations then, and you did a right. very good job of not really, I guess, exposing or letting it control what your next decision was going to be. And you, you know, I, I know the Ameriprise came up over a year and we were at mega and you're like, Oh yeah, we're dealing with these Ameriprise guys. I'm like, yeah, where'd that come from? But now I understand <laughs> that it came from a mistake that you made. And right. now you're, you're in this realm of this area that you had to open up your, um, your mind and your business to think a little differently. But I mean, what do you think that's going to, because again, the Allstate game could change. It's just changed recently, right? It changed right. back in 2014 where they weren't allowing mergers and now they were, and then they're not. And so you're kind of at the bane of these companies' decisions that they make. So how is that like forming your decisions now, year to year, month to month, you know, on what you're doing and what you're looking at to make sure that you're making the best decision for your company? For sure. So being in multiple platforms or multiple niches provides a level of granularity for our partner banks that fund our deals. So when one goes sideways or we lose traction or funding volume, it's not so catastrophic, right? Um, On a going forward basis, we're continuing to add new niches. I mean, we've got a few that we're working out with. Some of we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, non-disclosures and different things that we, we, you know, can't talk about, but, um, that's a mistake that will never be repeated. We will always continue to move into new niches. Now we'll always vet them with a fine tooth comb. So I've spent a lot of time on different industries that didn't pan out, that didn't work for our model and didn't meet our expectations for a lending niche. But, um, you know, we're, we're always expanding. I'm, I'm even doing that on the personal side, you know, um, what, what can I do? with my money, you know, um, PPC loan's been great. It's the greatest investment I'll ever make. You know, I have a a question just popped in my head. Why understanding the Ameriprise and the all state model, why have you guys never got into the independent model? We looked at it. You're saying independent insurance. Yeah. The independent insurance agencies. Like, I mean, you guys do so well and I know you understand the all state, but Right. As smart as you are, like I understand that they buy those based on EBITDA and, you know, there's different cash flow models inside of those agencies and there's definitely a different valuation. But why have you guys not expand? Because that market's so big. Right. So here's what I'll tell you. Um, we're 
we play in the little kids pool, right? We don't compete against Wells Fargo. When, when Wells Fargo says they do, they do middle market lending, they're talking about companies with like hundred million in revenue and up, right? Maybe 50 million and up. I deal with companies that are like 200,000 to 2 million in revenue. Um, so on the independent insurance side, if you're 200,000 in revenue, the carrier, they can drop you like that. Like you mean, you mean nothing to them. Um, they can come in and say, look, quadruple your business or dropping you. You don't have a lot of standing in the world in which you live when you're small. Now I know there's a lot of conglomerates and whatnot, but, uh, for us to feel comfortable playing in that arena, we would have to do loans that are much larger than we're comfortable extending. So yeah, I would feel very comfortable giving somebody who has, you know, 25 million in revenue, you know, $50 million to buy another 25 million in revenue, but I'm not comfortable lending that size of loan to individuals. Um, those are, those deals are getting done. Some of them by banks, whatnot, but the due diligence um, is a lot more too for you guys. Do what? The due diligence is a lot more. The due diligence is very unique. Yeah. I mean, part of, part of the problem, all states a blessing and a curse because anytime I go into a new industry, it gets compared to all state, right? It's like, well, all state has this great contract. And if the agent blows up, we get paid a TPP and we've never really lost any money on all state. And so it's, it's hard to come in and say, Hey, I know you guys love doing all state, but you need to start doing this independent. And it's like, well, tell us about it. Well, they don't have TPP and they can get terminated anytime by all their carriers. And, and you know, it's just, it's, it's ugly, but you're going to love it. You know, <laughs> it's a harder, <laughs> it's a harder step. It's hard enough. It's hard enough to get people to give me money at a reasonable price to lend, um, you know, to insurance agents, especially outside buyers, people with, you know, no ownership experience coming in, they can barely fog a mirror and have a hundred thousand from their grandma to lend them $1.3 million by Jay's agency, you know, or whoever's agency. And, uh, you know, that's not an easy thing to convince banks to do. If it was agents, we'd be able to walk into any local branch and get financing outside buyers. It's near impossible for them you to know. walk into a local local <laughs> bank and get funding. What that make? I'm laughing because it, some piece of that sounded like uh, getting to the end of the conversation. Someone saying, "So, what's your GPA?" Ah, <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, it has the same kind of uh, uh, br break screeching kind of feel to it, probably in some of those conversations. So, um, so Paul, you know, you were talking about the all your eggs in one basket kind of mistake. Um, at PPC, um, and I was thinking back to what you were talking about because there's a number of um, instances where you were talking about when you were growing up where you looked at everything and kind of did a formula around, so if I do this here, this here, this here, this here, this here, I'll be able to get there. And you said in a couple different instances, it was you know a certain class or something, but you mm -hmm. always, you're like, okay, I know, this year, this year, this year, this year. And it's the interesting thing is the what you described when all the eggs went in one basket was almost counter to the way Paul Clark had been thinking almost his entire life about how he approached stuff. So it was like, okay, so I've got this whole spread and I'm going this, 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 this. Right. And at that one time you narrowed it all to here and right. that's when it bit you. So it's it's right. almost like you're you knew. It was, I don't know whether it even felt different when you were in that space, even as as great as it was going. Something tells me um, that it kind of had this, it, this is really good, but somehow this just, you know, am I, is this train going to be here every morning when I wake up or is it going to be, uh, is it going to potentially blow up or are all my eggs in one basket? And so uh, I just find it interesting that even as a kid, when you were talking about laying things out in your strategy that that you always had a calculation as to and i'm guessing that's probably served you well in your business too because there's a lot of that going on in the business as well right um so where did that come from though was that is that a was that a natural thing that you kind of your 
looking at all the different pieces of puzzle and trying to figure out where they needed to be in the right combination? Did you somebody teach you that or is it is it just the way you thought about things? I don't really think anybody taught me that. I think, you know, when you have a learning disorder, you just have to be scrappy. Okay. You just have to be scrappy. And I think it just kind of came natural. You know, I was good at math. So building a formula, I mean, that was like my one subject, right? Mm -hmm. So building a formula and figuring out where I stood um, came very natural to me. Um, it just, it just made sense. This is a great question. Um, and obviously back to your kind of the crux of your question there. Yeah. I mean, it was a really big mistake based on my history, my upbringing, how I'd performed to get to where I was. It was, it doesn't make any sense. Right. But I think when I was in there, I was just like, I'm so done with this dental. It's not mm -hmm. profitable. The people in the dental industry are such a pain in the ass to deal with. I love these all state guys. They're salesmen. They look me in the eye. You know, you go meet a dentist at a dental trade show. They look at the floor, you know, they think you're like some scumbag salesman when you're trying to help them out. But all state agents, I'm like, these are my people. Like I'm finally, I'm working with my people. I love these guys. Um, so it was not just the, it wasn't just the, the nature of the business. It was also the relationships, I guess, that were attractive in that space right. too. And, and, and so, you, and so, you know, um, you know, we ended up getting out of dental anyways, it became such a, such a loss for us to, to be engaged in that business. We completely stepped aside, um, bank of America and, and Wells Fargo and some others completely overtook that business. Um, they destroyed us on the M&A business because for them, that was a loss leader. And then they were able to get to the dentists and the veterinarians mm -hmm. and lease them expensive equipment. You know, I mean, a CEREC machine in a dental office where the dentist can actually mill a crown in their office. I mean, those things were $100,000 plus. And they wow. were coming up with new versions of that every nine, 12 months. So that was a lucrative business for Bank of America. Them stealing a, you know, $1 million dollar acquisition deal from us at four and a half percent for 15 year fix. That was just a loss leader because then they knew they were going to get all the equipment leasing down the road. Yeah. But there's and so they there's... bullied us out of that industry. Nobody's bullied us out of all state because there is no ongoing financing needs. There's no large capital expenditure in an all state agency. You guys don't need to buy big pieces of equipment every 12 months. Mm. There's no accounts receivable factoring. I mean it's just straight cash flow. You know, you guys don't need large sums of money to buy equipment. I mean, you might need a computer here and there, but you don't yeah, need but, hundreds of thousands of dollars but a there's year. A, but that lesson still, even what you said just then, it, and I'm just always pulling, because I, you are probably 19 million miles over my head when it comes to discussing finance. So I'm I'm like scraping around the these, these, uh, these crumbs that are falling off the Paul Clark table into my I'm lab. sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, and I think it's important because part of what you just, when you mentioned getting out of dental, we got out of dental. Uh, but I think the takeaway for a lot of folks that are going to be listening and watching this is there will be times you have to step out of something, but it's probably a good idea to have something to step into before you step out of something. Exactly. Um, and yeah. that's where I was trying to go with the statement. I didn't finish my thought completely. It was the right decision to get out of dental. We actually should have a few years earlier. Okay. The the big fatal flaw was not having something else lined up. Not not having a place to go. Yep, you're totally right. Got it. Well, look, I get it. I you lost me on the EBITDA thing, whatever Jay was yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know. Ago, but I got that part. I got the eggs <laughs> in the basket there. <laughs> so, oh, you know, the thing I like about this podcast and actually having an authentic interview with people is, um. I sometimes can help diagnose people. Um, I don't know that sounds weird, but you know, I, I always under wanted to understand why you're so successful. And now it just hit me. Um, I just had an epiphany in talking to you. And that is that you don't think you're great at anything. And that's what drives you is you're always driving for excellence and greatness. And, and so I'm going to go back to a couple of things that you said. Um, you know, you said you had a learning disability. Um, and I truly don't believe in learning disabilities. Um, I think people learn differently. You just got to figure out how you learn um, and how right. you learn things. And different people are interested in different things. So, you know, a lot of schools are quick to access people and say, you have a learning disability just because you don't learn the way that they've been teaching for the last hundred years. It's just, you learn differently. 
So you kind of sold yourself. And, and the thing that's funny is the way that you appear to me as a very intelligent person. Every time we have a conversation, there's information, not just in banking, but in a lot of different areas of life that I've learned from you. And so, but you don't see yourself that way. So you're always striving for more. And, you know, so I, that, that's one thing, even down to the competitive in sports, you don't really think you're that great in sports. That's what makes you so awesome at sports is because you're always trying to get a better shot. You're always trying to make a better swing. And I think for people listening, that's going to have success and greatness in their life. That's kind of the attitude, not kind of, that's the attitude you need to have is that you've never really arrived. And I think even with all of your success, because if you compare yourself to most people, you've had a lot more success, right? And I'm not trying to, you know, throw you out there or brag, but I can brag on you. I'd rather brag on you than have other people brag. But, you know, you have two really nice homes on a really nice Tiger Woods golf course that I actually got to stay in and play golf. And it was just, and that's success, you know, I mean, that you could take your family to. Last year it was Thanksgiving. I, I was around this time last year that I came to see you and you were going to have right. family over the next week for, and, and the reason you have all these things is because, you have this insatiable drive to get better. So my question though, that I've never asked on here before, and I, I ask about mentors because I really think mentors are important in people's lives and they come in different ways, different conversations, and maybe they're not direct, maybe they're indirect. But right now, um, who do you feel like as a mentor that you're kind of learning from in the next journey of your life right now? Like that you, you could say, hey, when I have a conversation with this person, I learn from them or, you know, even if it's online, they, they might not even know that they're your mentor that you're learning from currently to take, because I know you're, you're going to take PPC to the next level. I know you're going to take, you know, whatever you touch to the next level, because I know you're always looking for the next opportunity that's going to help your family thrive and help you thrive and help your brain thrive. So who, who right now is mentoring you maybe, you know, physically, or maybe they have no idea. Yeah. So this person wouldn't know that they're my mentor. We haven't talked about that designation between each other. We do have conversation. Um, I was actually on a Zoom call with him last night. Uh, his name is Rob Rimfro. Um, he's a pastor at my church, and he's unbelievable speaker. He's written many books, and um, he gives amazing perspective. Uh, you know and I, I watch him all the time. He does great series. Um, but he did one the other day. And it was about unlearning. He did a series about unlearning things. And he did one on tolerance and about how there's the old view of tolerance and this new view of tolerance um, about how the world is essentially saying um, tolerance is agreeing that everybody has their own truths, that there's no worldly truths. Um, and there's, and he did one the other day after the election and it was just so good. Um, and my wife often, she'll send me a text. She's like, you need to fast forward to 37 minutes and 20 seconds, watch eight and a half minutes. This is what you need to hear right now. <laughs> Cause she watches him all the time. Oh, that's efficient. And, like that. and, and I just, I just love the guy. Um, he's fantastic. Uh, he's, um, a little older, he probably works 70 to 80 hours a week at the church. He runs a men's Bible study. We have about 700 guys that do it. He writes books. He runs a publication. Um, but he, he really gets it. And it's very applicable to every man. And he'll tell you what you need to hear. It's not too churchy, but it's scripture based. Um, you know, uh, so I, I just love Rob. I mean, I can never get enough Rob. Um, you know, so, uh, I can, I can, there's probably two really good sermons I could send you speeches that he's done. I can send you afterwards, but yeah, do that. Rob is yeah, we'll really, share, we'll share it on the success paradigm too. Um, That's it's not, part. it's not necessarily going to make me better at business, but I think it'll make me a better person better husband, better father, better employer, um, more respectful of everybody else on the planet. Um, and that's really, I'll be honest with you, that's really my number one focus right now. Um, I love PPC. It's fun. 
I have great partners. We're bringing a new partner on January 1st, our first ever female partner. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm really coaching and pushing them to do more. Um, but on the personal side, you know, I'm really, that's a really big focus of mine. Sounds like he's a good teacher. Uh, yes. Uh, and, and the, the people that I admire that operate in any corner of the faith community, whatever faith community is, that that's what I, that's what I herald most is that I feel like I'm learning, not just, um, not learning about what I need you know, about, you know, why my feet, the bottom of my feet are always so hot because I'm working, walking on hot coals all the time, but that I'm actually being, my mind is being expanded with a real lesson. So Jay asked about your mentor. I'm going to flip you into mentor mode for a lot of people, uh, Paul, because you mentioned something earlier that I really wanted to circle back to. Uh, you actually had Jay write down that um, phrase around struggle um, and yes. the importance of it. And, uh, you know, when you mentioned the the struggle that you knew you had in school when it came to, uh, you know, the class that you were in and having to, like, even figuring out the formulas, all of those things seem to be, so I have... I have this challenge in front of me. This is how I'm going to overcome it. This is how I'm going to to process through it. And you talked about your children and, you know, kind of almost hoping that they don't live too struggle free a life because that's where the real growth happens. But most people, all of us are going to face struggle. Um, and if you haven't faced it in a while, it's probably going to be sometime tomorrow because that's how struggle is. But I think our natural inclination as people, and I know in my past, it's certainly been the case for me, is that uh, struggle uh, kind of invokes that fight or flight type thing. And I think most people, when they find themselves in the middle of a struggle, a lot of people, uh, maybe not most, but a lot of people choose the flight realm because to power through struggle, me, I already know it's not gonna be pleasant it's going to probably hurt. It's probably going to make me lose sleep. I'm probably going to have to do things I don't want to do. So this, when I'm facing that dragon, there's nothing beautiful in the dragon except getting to the other side of the dragon. But sometimes all we can see is the dragon. And so rather than move forward, we move backward. So as the mentor, Paul Clark, who, uh, and by the way, share, thank you for sharing and being vulnerable about that, because I'm guessing there's a bunch of people that are going, you know what? I see that in my kids, too. Um, I can see me and my kids, too. What is it that Paul Clark, the mentor, really wants people to understand about struggle and why you you really landed on that earlier? What what is it that you want people to when they want to stop when they see this? Because sometimes the struggle gets bigger when you enter it. What is it that you would want people to know or think about or do when they find themselves facing that dragon? Right. That's a great question. Um, I mean, for me, I've always, I, I have to have something behind the dragon that motivates me. So with school, it was like, I have to graduate high school and I have to go. I like, I just, I don't know why, but I really wanted to go, um, you know, to college, um, and get that done. Uh, you know, like I think about health, right? Like to me, I know Jay is a big workout fan. When he came down, he and I worked out together with my trainer and Sam said, hi, by the way, I told him we were going to do this. Um, Sam's my trainer. He loves Jay. Jay loves him. Um, you know, part of the reason I work out is, and this is a little morbid, but I have this fear of lying on my deathbed at a young age and my kids sitting there and them knowing in their head that I shouldn't be there because I didn't take care of myself. Mm. And it's like, I can't let that happen. I might get hit by a bus tomorrow. I'm fine with that. I mean, it wouldn't be great. I can live with that, but I can't live with being 55 years old, having my kids there at 20 something, watching me take my last breaths because I didn't take care of myself. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think for me, it's always finding 
I have to find that thing behind. And like I mentioned before, with like with PPC loan, part of the reason I fight and Jay's right, it's not just about me and me being successful, me having money. Like I really, a lot of times think about and focus on my employees. You know, I think about, man, what a grave response, what a great responsibility I have to make sure that these people can come to work today, every day, have gainsful employment, have employment that challenges them and strengthens their lives and pr- puts food on their family's tables. I mean, I know there's many women are in our office who make more money than their husbands. And that means a lot to me. It's a big deal. I take employing people very seriously. And so sometimes that's the thing behind the dragon. Mm-hmm. If it's just something for me, you know, like the death pit story, it's not for me. I can't stand the thought of my kids sitting there watching me wilt away because I didn't take care of myself because I didn't exercise because I didn't diet. I can't, I can't put them through that. And so for me, I hope that kind of answers your question, but for me, for me, it's the, it's the reason that's behind the dragon. And sometimes the dragon gets so big, you can't see it. And you got to remind yourself of it. You know, sometimes when I'm not working out or I didn't eat good for a whole week or whatever, you got to remind myself, you know, we're 45, we're not 25, you know, Mm -hmm. Jay's like 52. He's way older than me. (laughs) Um, Not true. (laughs) <laughs> Not true. So, so you know, I, you know, it's funny. In the middle of your story, um, your fifteen-year-old comes out in the story. Um, right. You you switched to him, and we've had many conversations. We've had more conversations about your wife and your children than we actually have about you. I'm learning more today right. than I have in the last fifteen years um, because every time it goes back to them and how proud you are of them and. I mean, I, you have like a, a chipping green in your backyard that, you know, how <laughs> your son has gotten at golf. And, you know, right. when I'm playing, you tell me how much better your 10 year old is than me. And like, you know, that I should really work on my game. And, you know, so it, it, it's really good motivation for me when I play with you. But I know, you know, hearing that story about your kids and being on your deathbed. Legacy is important to you mm-hmm. and what you leave your kids with. And I think family and friends and all of that stuff that you talked about that you want to carry on that really shaped you and really made you who you are. And when you think of your legacy, if you were on your deathbed, because you go morbid a lot and think about that, and that's what drives you into the gym. <laughs> what, what would be the three things if you were on your deathbed? Yes. That you would want your three, your two kids to carry through to the rest of the people that they meet in this world and say, this is what I want you to leave with every single person you meet. And I want this to be my legacy. What would those three things be that you would want them to leave? It's the easiest question you've asked so far, Jay. Number one, I have have both boys. So I would say marry a great woman. Marry a great woman. I married an amazing woman. She's amazing. Um, She always just knows the right thing to say to me. And when I'm a little off, she'll find something like um, a scripture passage or a part of a sermon or maybe something else. And uh, she's just so fantastic. I mean, if you think about it, you know, to me, the me- there's a lot of ways we measure a man, right? To me, one of the greatest ways you can measure a man is the quality of his kids. And you only get to determine half of your kids with your DNA. The other half is the woman that you choose to be your wife. And, you know, we all want a great looking wife. My wife is fantastic looking, um, you know, but finding someone who has all of the qualities that you admire in a spouse um, that will love you for who you are. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's just so critical because I don't think, you know, when you really, I don't think a lot of people think about it, but you're building your kids with half your DNA and half of your spouse's DNA. <clears throat> and I think it's really critical to choose a great woman that you can love forever. You know, my parents are still married. My wife's parents are still married. They're both hitting their 50th wedding anniversary um, coming up. So I would say marry, find a great, great woman. Um, number two is have a sense of urgency. To me, that was one of my biggest things that made me successful. I always had a sense of urgency. I never missed any deadline. When a customer called for me and I was in somebody else's office, I ran down the hall 
every single time. I would sprint. I didn't want the customer to be on hold for eight seconds. I wanted them to be on hold for four seconds. Nobody asked me to do that at PPC. I did that every time. I would run every time somebody was on hold. I would run down the hall to get their call. That extra four seconds I could run made the difference to me because I wanted their experience to be better. Nobody saw me running. None of the customers saw me running. I just did that every time. And I think for guys, it's especially critical as they're moving into business. I mean, you got to be early. Um, you know, my sons all the time, I'm like, let's go move your butt, get in the car. Your mom's already in the car. Why is the mom in the, why is mom in the car ahead of you guys? Let's go. Sense of urgency, move it, hurry up, hurry up. Um, it's one of our core values at PPC loan. Um, and it's just something that's always stuck with me. I don't like slow. I don't like excuses. I don't like after the fact or do it later. I like do it right now. If you think of something you can do, do it right now. I always do stuff right now because I'll forget. I'll forget. So have a sense of urgency. And then the third one, um, I'll actually read Matthew 20, uh, 22 verses 36 through 39. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord God with all your heart. And then he said, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And to me, the love your neighbor as yourself thing is so critical. And it's one thing to tell people to love your neighbor, tell your kids, love your neighbor. I think all these things you have to um, do by example. And so, I don't know, it's kind of a small gesture, but I make a big point when we're out in public and I'm with my kids, especially if we run into somebody who um, is different than us, um, whether it be religion or just various backgrounds and stuff, I try to be extra nice to those people, whether it's in a drive through I treat everybody with respect, but I wanna make a, a significant point to my boys that, um, you know, just because we have different may have different political views or ph philosophies or things we need to, we need to love everybody. Um, and I think it's just, I think it's just so critical. You know, you only get, you only get to kids to live in your house so long. And I really don't think, I think Tiger Woods dad said, you don't instill anything in a child. You, you can only encourage the development of it. And so, um, you know, having a sense of urgency, um, sometimes I'm probably trying to instill it, even though in my mind, I feel like I'm encouraging the development of it. <laughs> um, so those are, those are my three things. I would say, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, marry a great woman and move your butt and have a sense of urgency. I love that. So, so just really quick, I, I gotta, I gotta back you up on the sense of urgency, just from yes. my personal experience with you. Yes. Uh, you know, you're the CEO of, you know, a pretty big company with a lot of loans. And I will tell you every single time, if, if you hadn't answered my phone call within five to 10 minutes, I would get a phone call right back from you. If you missed my call or a text. You remember the one time I didn't answer your call? Uh, didn't call you back? You were got hit in the head with a golf club. Yeah. Yeah. That was the only time, but that was excused. <laughs> You were I, did, I had no idea where that was going, but I swear to God, I had well, I no idea. I figured Jay would remember. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Of course, because I was worried because I called Stephen. I was like, okay, well, I've been calling Paul, and Paul has not called me back, and that's not, is he dead? Is What's going on? Why is Paul not calling me back? So, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking birth of a child, something like that. He was in a golf Got him. club there you go. contest. and. <laughs> That might be a story for another day, but that's actually a good story that that led to a lot of transfer transformative action in the company. I, yes, that sounds like a whole podcast right there. It it probably is. Uh, so you know, we I stumbled upon every once in a while, Jay and I stumble upon something that we think about asking, and it's like, oh, that's a pretty decent question. And then if it's me, I always forget it for like two or three podcasts before I get back around to it. But one of the ones that came to mind recently was because a lot of people look to you for uh, guidance and leadership at, in the workplace. I'm, I'm going to extend and say that that probably happens uh, in the faith community too, because people see your example of the way you live your life. 
And so there's probably a lot of advice you've given to people over the years. And some of it probably is, there are probably some Clarkisms in there somewhere that are like some go-tos. Uh, the question I have for you is, of all those things that you typically share with people when you're giving them uh, advice or guidance or just your insights on something, which of the lessons that you find that you have actually shared most with other folks are also ones that you kind of have to tell yourself as well. So, you know, Paul, you know, you say this all the time to all these other people, but this is one you'd really need to, to um, look in the mirror and share back out, which, what, what would that be? Right. That's two podcasts in a row with a great question. That is, that is, that means yeah, it probably wow. won't happen next week is basically because Greg, Greg asks all the best questions. <laughs> Jay's, Jay's never, Jay's never going to have me back on for that follow-up <laughs> podcast about the club in the head. I'll bring you on, Paul. We'll, we'll do it I'll on just, uh, Yeah, time. we'll do yeah. a separate deal. Um, okay, I'm going to try my best to answer your question. I don't know if I'm going to nail it, but okay. here it goes. So I, one of the best things I'm involved in is coaching sports. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm always the head coach. I love being the head coach. So I've done 16, 17 teams. And... It takes a little while. It takes a few teams to get your feet under yourself, kind of understand how to interact with, with the kids on your team. Um, you know, how much time to devote to, you know, practices, scrimmage, games, setting the lineup, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I realized over time that a lot of the coaches in our leagues are focused, all they care about is the result, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, whether even in junior golf, the, the caddy, the dad would carry caddy for the kid. And if they had a bad shot, I actually saw a 13 year old get spanked on the driving range for hitting a bad shot. It was wow. the craziest thing I've ever seen. And I'm sitting here thinking, man, if Mike Trout makes an error in right field, right. And he comes in after the end of the inning and let's say it costs him two runs. Do you think that manager yells at the kid? Mike Trout, Mike knows what he did, right? He mm -hmm. knows he missed the ball. Now, we may run more drills to kind of try to catch balls up against the fence or whatever. So I, I realize, especially with younger kids in baseball, baseball is such a fragile sport. You know, the batting average, the success percentage is so low. Um, that I completely, I gave no coaching or any commentary around results. And it was really hard to get my assistant coaches to buy in this because in baseball, you get assistant coaches. You got somebody over there doing third base coach, first base coach. You got somebody in the dugout making sure these little kids get out there on deck and all that. And they would react. And I would get so mad at them. I'm like, when, when they make an error, I want no reaction. No reaction. And um, we always – we would talk about what happened after the game. And we would work on what we needed to improve during practice. And we would talk about why we were practicing those things in practice. But we never talked about results. And my big thing was after games, if we had a game that we won and the kids didn't hustle and stuff, I would give a negative post-game speech, right? Because they're already all jacked up. They're like, we won. That's all they care about. And I would be like, we didn't hustle at all. And then the next game... In practice, I would make them run. And then the next game, we'd hustle and we'd lose. And I would say, this is one of my favorite games of the season. It's the mm -hmm. best you guys have played all year. And they're just like, what is going on? <laughs> um, but the results thing, I still remember um, we, we went on a little run there. And I think, I think a youth sports is all mental from a coaching aspect. If you can live inside the kid's head and get them in the right mindset, you will win. So we had won like two championships in a row, Little League Baseball, and we were going for three in a row. And the coach on the other team, I knew the coach, but he had never won a championship before. And I was coaching third base, and they were the other team was in the third base dugout. And we had just – they had scored like two runs in the top of the inning, and then we scored three. And all the kids came off the field, and we shouldn't have scored any. They gave us a couple of the runs with errors or whatever. And all the kids from his team came and got over – got over by the dugout and he was like, what is wrong with you kids? 
making all these errors. Do you even want to win? All your parents are here. It's championship game. And I went over, back over the dugout and I told my assistant coach, I said, game over. We won. He goes, what are you talking about? I'm like, it's over. We won. He was like, how can you know that? I said, he's over there yelling at them about results. And it's the first inning. I'm like, we won the game. We ended up winning like 15 to four. It was like a total blow up. He just completely, completely um, blew the, you know, set them off course because he was only focused on results. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. I love coaching. It's the most yep. funnest thing I've ever done. Well, is it is that a is that a, a, a Paul Clark conversation that Paul Clark has with Paul yes. Clark from time to time? Yes, because I need because yes, mm -hmm. yes. If I'm playing golf, I get mad about the result, <laughs> even though I did all the right process, and then I hit a Jay Atkins shot, and I'm like, what was that? Well, they <laughs> <laughs> what was that? You know what? Uh, I love you, Paul Clark, because you find a way. You find a way. <laughs> I love Jay. I thought he was going to give me a harder time. Like, he hasn't said anything. He, he hasn't made fun of my bald head or anything. He's just been so nice. It's just uh, how much you and Greg look alike. It's crazy. It's, a, it's, <laughs> it's, Oprah, it's the Oprah after the show, Paul. It's, it's a different. We could be twins. We could be yeah, twins. That's exactly before right. I, before I get to my next question, I want to elaborate on, on that because I think that's so hard to do. Like, it's hard to not, I mean, I, and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make this about me. Yes. Um, so when you say don't focus on the result now, I know like in golf, like, you know, you got to focus on the next shot and you got to, but when you've had a bad month or you've had a bad result, I mean, what, so what do you do psychologically when you're focused on the result to unfocus and say, okay, I need to, I mean, what do you, what, do you, what is that shift in your mind that takes you out of that moment? And, and I guess, how do you control it? Because I quite honestly would probably be that coach screaming at those kids. Right. It's you know, 95%. And, you know, and so 95%, it's hard. You know, I, at the end of the day, you know, we have a pipeline report at the office that shows, how many applications we're getting in? How much revenue is coming in? How, when, when deals are closing, who's sent for approval? Who's approved? And I stopped looking at that two years ago. I haven't looked at it in two years. What I do focus on is our preparation, our process, all the all practice. I focus on practice, right? And then we go out and execute, and then I can't do anything else. Because I put in all the work, we did all the prep work we were supposed to, and we went out and we executed our game plan. And the results will be the results. But That's when, what I try to. But when they're bad, how do you, do you just focus more on practice? You just talk about what we need to do better? Well, yeah, you might have to reassess. Okay. You might have to get a new game plan. We might need a swing change. Okay. You know, I'm using that metaphorically saying business yeah, swing change, right? right? So, you know, you, you've lived in a pretty positive state your whole life. Um, and you have, I mean, even, even, even just not focusing on the results, which is just a total brain screw for me. Um, <laughs> it's hard because 47 years, everything to me has been about a result, right? Measuring, you know, income, measuring, you know, growth in an agency. I mean, everything's measured. We in, have sport, in sports, we never won until we stopped focusing on results, the coaching staff. The kids still focus on results. They're like, "Oh, we won." Come I'm, sorry, I'm not going to sleep tonight because I'm going to be thinking about this and how I can how I can do this. <laughs> so, being that you don't focus on the results, I'm sure you did at some point in your life. But all yes. of us um, have regrets in our life um, that we've learned from. Like I, I, you know, I shared this in the last podcast, and just to give you an example, kind of get you on the track. It doesn't have to be just business; it can be personal. But one of the biggest regrets I have in my life is. When I had a child at 19 years old, um, I wasn't the father that I should have been. Um, so I don't have the relationship that I should have with my blood, my daughter that I brought into this world, which that regret that I live with is my fuel to be the best father to my daughter, Luna, Great. and my new daughter to come, Sky. That, that, that's my everything. That's my priority. Like That's first and then everything else is second, which... Before having that experience and now having Luna, I really couldn't connect with people saying my kids are my first priority, right? I just, I couldn't connect with it. 
but now yeah. I do. So that's my biggest regret that I have in my life. I said, I wish I would have been different, but I've channeled it. So what would one of those regrets be for you that you've, you've, you made a poor decision, but it actually made you a much better, you know, individual in whatever situation it might be. Oh, Jay. Um, gosh. Um, I'm going to answer this in a roundabout way. And then you push me a little bit if you don't like this answer. I'm so, good. so we, we both like Tiger Woods, right? You and I were texting back and forth. He won the Masters last year. That was like so awesome, right? He designed our golf course. Everybody here was so excited. Um, did you read the book, The Big Miss? No. Hank Haney, his coach, wrote the book, The Big Miss. And I don't read books very often, rarely. I know you're going to ask me about books maybe. And I'll, I'll tell you what I think, but um, I read Tiger's book and I read um, John Daly's book, but this Tiger's book, it's called the big miss. And the premise of the book was that he was trying to build a golf swing that took out the big miss, right? Cause he was clearly better than everybody else. And Tiger's Achilles heel was that big left to right. I mean, right to left snap, right? That went way left. And so if he was trying to hit a cut, he would aim down the left side of the fairway. And if he hit that big miss, it would go off the planet left and it would be, you know, out of bounds, re -tee. And so, and you know, Jay, when you're playing real golf, when I'm playing good golf, the ball only goes two directions, straight and right. If the golf ball is going three directions, you're in trouble. If it's going left, right, and straight, and you don't know where it's going, you're in trouble. But when I'm playing good, good golf, it only goes straight and right. And so... His whole thing was in the book is they were trying to develop a swing for Tiger that only went two directions because he was so much better than everybody else. If he could take out the catastrophic drive that went way offline, he would never lose. Right now within the book, there's a lot in commentary about Tiger's life. I thought it was inappropriate. Some of the stories he shared about Tiger and his wife conversations they'd had where they, they had let him into a personal setting that he, I thought he shouldn't have shared, but some of the undertones of it, to me, the big miss wasn't just about golf, the golf swing. Tiger's big miss was all this catas catastrophe that, you know, carnage that he left with all these women and Vegas and hookers and all this stuff. Right. Now, the golf world loves him. They don't judge him for it. He's had full repentance from those that love golf. But that was a huge miss, okay? He mastered golf. Professionally speaking, Tiger has no miss. Personally speaking, he has a huge miss, I think. Huge miss on the personal side. Um, now, he's recouped. His kids still love him. He's got a great life, all that stuff. So for me... I would have to say, if I really thought about it, there are probably some small regrets. I don't have a big personal regret. So it's very hard for me to come up with something. So as much as I love Tiger, he and I are kind of the opposite. His professional career never missed. I mean, 15 majors, are you kidding me? Nobody will ever do that again. The competition he's played against is so deep. I mean, Jack couldn't win 10 nowadays. Um, but where where Tiger was perfect on the business professional side, I think that's where my misses have been. Um, I, I explained the big one to you guys, and you feel free to press me on it, but um, I still think, even though I feel like a good leader, I feel like we have great people, I feel like they like working for me, I feel like we still have quite a ways to go to be really ironclad in our business to where, um, you know, we don't have to worry about future downfalls. Um, and I don't know if that really answers your question or not, Jay. Your big miss is not um, diversifying sooner and getting fat and happy um, with right. healthy. So you would right. say the your big miss or your biggest regret is not seeing that. But again, what it's done is it's made you diversify way beyond where you were. Right. Um, that's, that's, you know, kind of what I'm looking for in, in, okay. the, in the question is, you know, I have regrets in business, you know, uh, I have regrets in, and I don't live with them where they, they, you know, torture me. Um, right. they, 
they've made me develop and become better. Um, and that's what I'm looking for, you know, when they're, and I think that analogy with Tiger Woods is really, really good because we both love Tiger Woods. I, I love Tiger right. Woods. He was so exceptional at his craft um, and his, his practice and all of that, which is just, you know, to become excellent. You know, we've talked about that. And when I do these takeaways, that's just so important is to focus on practice, right? I mean, that way when you're in the game and you're playing, you're, you're on. So I, I think that's, that's a, a good answer. Um, we yeah, just got a lot of back around. Yep. Uh, and it's, and the take, so when you were talking about that big miss, if that's what we're calling this is I, I remembered how your voice changed when you talked to, it was not just the big miss for business. It was the big miss is like, I had to tell people to people that they don't have a job anymore. And mm -hmm. that you, that the big miss was big. It wasn't just a big miss uh, on spreadsheets, it was a big miss because of um, how important uh, and how uh, how much weight there is in your heart relative to making sure you're doing the right thing by your employees and having the right. But it also taught you, because it sounds like that kind of lit a fire for what you say to other people too, because there's the conversation that you were talking about with the questionnaire you did at the mega conference. It's like, look guys, don't do that. I that look. You don't want to be me. I'm just going to make sure that you are not walking down that same path and right. uh, and experiencing the same big miss. So it actually kind of, um, in a weird way, you kind of became evangelistic about making sure that people are not, you know, cornering themselves and putting themselves in you know a too small and singular and narrow a spot to the point. Because I've been in, I've been at mega conferences too. That uh, that is a, that's a crowd that has a lot of stuff figured out, and they so do. to take a message into that crowd that says, "I know you've got it figured out, but based on these survey questions I got here, I got news for you guys." So it actually even puts you in that space. So um, that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So Paul, I'm going to ask some some quick questions here. Um, yes. Going here an hour and a half. We, I mean, we, I could talk another two hours with you because it's. I love I love having a conversation with you. I mean, we do this sometimes on the phone, um, I'll just call you for five minutes to talk, and then I look down and we have talked about 15 topics. And so I'm like, okay, I got to go, dude. And you're like, yeah, me too. I gotta I gotta go work out with Sam. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what what is one habit like? that you do every day, it could be in your business or personal life that you feel like feeds your soul or has made you successful. Like something that you're, cause you're a pretty regimented person or you wouldn't be great at golf or you wouldn't be good at running a business. So what, what's one habit you could share with people that you do every day? Yeah. So, um, I, I, I really am regimented in the morning. I eat the same thing every morning for breakfast. My wife makes me a shake, really healthy shake. Um, I do the opposite. I know a lot of you guys like to get up really early. Um, <laughs> I sleep in until my kids get up. I get the same up the same time as my kids, and I drop them off at school. I drop typically drop my youngest off at school, but I love my morning routine. You know, I don't. I'm like you. I don't touch the phone. I, I take my kid to school at. You know, he and I wake up at like 7.30. <laughs> I drop him off at school at like 8.10. He eats Cheerios. I listen to him talk. Man, he's 12. It's just like talk, 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 talk. You know, he's got so many big ideas. Um, And then I come back and, you know, get ready for the day. But I really like that morning time. Um, I'm a little jealous of my wife. She wakes up every morning earlier and she says a prayer and then goes and does a Bible study every single morning. Um, before anybody else gets up and then she gets our oldest son up to take him to golf practice. But not, I like my little morning routine. You're not really that jealous. You, you like to sleep in. <laughs> I do. So, so I actually I, do. I mean, I remember we had a later tea time, which made me happy because I could do my morning routine, which was meditate. Yeah. Read, all that other stuff. So you're like, Hey, we're, we're going to get around breakfast. Like, All people oh. have a bigger battery. We need more sleep to recharge that battery. That's, that's, that's right. Exactly. Uh, so more a morning routine that makes you happy is, is a habit. I think that's a great, I think that's a great yeah. way people, because I think mornings for most people are the most stressful, right? And then your whole entire day is stressed. Um, right. So what's your, um, when you hear the word success, mm -hmm. this quick, when you hear the word success 
you know, this is a success paradigm and different people have different levels of what success means to them. But when you hear it today, November 10th, 2020, what does success mean and look like to you? Oh, that's a good question. You know, for me, I think there's been so much negativity around 2020. For me personally, this has probably been one of my favorite years ever. I'll be honest with you. The year has gone so slow. I've been in the house more. It's felt like I've had three times the amount of time with the kids than I've normally had. You know, they spent most of the first half of the year working remote and I've just loved it. You know, there was a little transition period there where we were all kind of getting used to each other, especially with like my 15 year old. It's like, oh, dad, uh, uh. you know, you starting to get the age where I, I, I get this. I see a little look in his eye. I think he thinks he can whip me. Oh, yeah. There's I a think moment. he's getting close, you know. Um, but I, I don't know. I think just, just he definitely, being able to, yeah. he what? He definitely knows more than you. My, my 16 year old has more. Oh, uh, dude. That's like a million times more than me. Oh, no doubt. But, uh, he has great hair too. I'm kind of jealous of his hair, honestly. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I just, I just like the way the year's gone. You know, it's just slowed everything down more family time for me. Success is, I almost, I don't like the mass, but I mean, kind of the new normal of the work from home and more family time and more focus on the house and the home and, and whatnot. I just, I really like it. You know, I like getting out from time to time, but I'm not one. Of, I'm, I really couldn't go out every night with friends and stuff. A lot of people, they're like, they want to go out all the time. Like I really enjoy being at the house, eating uh, dinner with the family. I mean, that's, I couldn't agree with you. Like, I didn't realize how much I hated to travel until I stopped. Right. You right. Know, being on an airplane and always being in a hotel. Like I, to me, and I, I know this sounds so harsh because people have passed away because of this disease, but 2020 has been the best year for me. I've gotten more done this year. I've spent more time with my family. I'm closer with my daughter because I'm not gone every other week. And right. I, mean, I agree with you. Like this is, this is the new normal is okay with me. But Right. My wife needs the mask, but I'm like, no, listen, I, I don't really mind the mask because I'm a germaphobe. So that means people aren't going to be sneezing on me and coughing on me. And I'm not going to, I mean, you know, when I was in Texas, we, I went and got a flu shot. Like you went with yeah. me in order to get the flu shot. So I'm Before a germaphobe. Or golf round. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to be sick. So right. you know, wearing a mask, it doesn't really bother me that much. My wife's like, I hate the mask. I'm like, listen, you, look, those, you see that guy sneezing and coughing over there? <laughs> I got to get that. So, oh, so I know yeah, you had, he had M95 mask in the mid nineties, Paul. This was, I believe it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't, I don't mind it a bit, especially not in public. I'm good with it. Like I, I wish there was a way you could do it while you eat. So they could just like open the mask and it would close <laughs> when you were eating. But I mean, maybe someone will that. I mean, I'm going to see what I can find on the internet. I might have to buy you a Christmas gift. <laughs> Diversify. So, so I know you're not, you say you're not a big reader, which, which really surprises me because you have. Well, I'm a, not a big book reader. I didn't okay. say I wasn't a big reader. Okay. So you read a lot of articles and. You want um, to tell you what I read? Yes. Okay. So here's what I do. Number one, Wall Street Journal. Okay. I believe every person on the planet should read the Wall Street Journal. It's the only real journalism that still exists today. That's it. Nothing else. Everything else is just personal opinions. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I spend equal time every day reading something I agree with and something I disagree with. Wow. Yeah. So, um, you know, for everybody at home would obviously know, I might spend 10 minutes on CNN and 10 minutes on Fox News. Yep. I'm not going to tell you which one I agree with and which one I disagree with. <laughs> but that's just an example. It's not always the, I do the exact same. My wife is just like, they're so different. I'm like, I know. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, yeah. you, want, you want real journalism? Go read the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. <laughs> and then, uh, um, and then what? And else? then my, my third one is, and I know this is going to sound cliche, but I really think the Bible. I mean, I think even non-Christians, there's so much that you can get out of the Bible about the right way to live. Um, it's my, favorite, my favorite uh, verse is from James. And I think it's the most 2020 verse that you could ever have. 
And it's been my favorite verse for a long time. I'm going to read it to you. It's very short. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Think about that, 2020. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Man, couldn't we all use some more perseverance? Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That is like the Bible verse of 2020. That is, holy cow. Yeah, and that's been my favorite verse. I bought my dad a Bible last December for Christmas, and I highlighted that that verse in James 1, and I gave it to him and read it to him. So that's that, that's that me. Is, I don't read books. Awesome. I, in the last five years, I probably read the big short. If I'm going to read a book, it's going to be something really entertaining. In John Daly's book, I mean, that is not family-friendly book, but man, that is a crazy book. <laughs> is it good? Oh, it is. You would like it, Jay. <laughs> it, John Daly's crazy. I mean, I didn't know he was that crazy until I read his book. I have a copy. I'll mail it to you if you want. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would love. I would. Love. I don't know if you like audiobooks. I can't do. I, like, I do it on the iPad. I do yeah. everything because I can highlight all the notes and I can go back. Right. So we have the book club, so it allows me to go back in and kind of remember what I read. So, right. Well, Paul, I, man, I really, really appreciate your time today, man. This was a really interesting podcast, and I. I you know, you you are one of my favorite people, and I, you know, that two and a half days that I got to come out and spend with you, you know, we talked great. about a lot of different. Dude, I enjoyed every single second of that. I mean, you you just you're just a great human being. I mean, everything from our workout to golf to just sitting around. I think that was during the impeachment hearing with Trump. I mean, it was just a lot of stuff going on, and I mean, it was just interesting. We were talking about some all state stuff and. I just, there's not a second that I um, dread when I'm with you. And I just, I, I love that you're my friend um, forever uh, for life. I want to be in your life and I hope you'll be in my life forever. And yeah. um, I, I appreciate that, man. And I appreciate you coming on here and, and sharing your story because I think it's going to empower and um, help a lot of people. So thank you. No, I really appreciate it. It means a lot. And, and a lot of the stuff I said, I've never said to anybody, you know, yeah. that's so, what, uh, wow. it was, it was really cool to actually get to say this stuff out loud. So Awesome. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, at, at this at this point, um, I go through the ingredients of Paul Clark's success and I kind of recap it. And, and, you know, we say this on every podcast, but uh, Greg and I are writing a book, um, The Success Paradigm, and we're going to take all of these takeaways and kind of elaborate on them and kind of talk about how you can put them in your life. But, you know, you'll actually get the credit for all of these. So are you cool if we mention you in the book? You can write a book about me, Jay. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, didn't, I didn't say that. I, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Always putting words. Um, so, uh, definition of success and what's made you successful is family, friends, sports, and school. Um, that was your journey that shaped you. Um, and through sports, it really created a competitive spirit. Um, you should laugh a lot. Um, you should have a high bar on effort. Um, don't have too much technology in your life. The eighties was the time that really made people grow. And now technology is kind of taking that growth and relationships away from people. So just be, be really smart with that. Um, struggle is the only mandatory ingredient for success. I love that quote that you um, had in there. And then you said, don't feel bad if you're not traditional smart because worldly smart ends up working out for the most successful people um show up early value what you make us uh wait let's see i mess up I always gotta mess up one value what makes us oh value is what makes us what you learn that doesn't make any sense um let's you can't read it on handwriting maybe That's something greg said well, well, let's scratch that from <laughs> <like it then. laughs> That will not be in the book. Multiple income. <laughs> All right, let's get back on track here. Uh, multiple income streams is very, very important. Diversify your opportunities, which I thought was really, really unique in what you said. Uh, don't get fat and happy. There is a formula for everything. 
find motivation to get through the struggles. Marry a great woman is what you want to leave with your kids, but choose very, very wisely in the process. Sense of urgency and never, ever miss a deadline and love yourself. Do it right now. You don't instill, you encourage. Don't focus on the result. Focus on practice. What you see as success is having family time and focusing on home. Things that you read as a Wall Street Journal, things that you watch, listen to, or read are things that you agree with and disagree with, and the Bible. And mentors should always give amazing perspective. They should tell people what they need to hear and they should make people better. And let me see if I can go back to this one here because I, I, got, I got to make up. So show believe value what you, oh, okay, got it. Value what you make versus what you learn. So you might not be making a lot, but you might be learning a lot along the way. And that has value, yes. basically what you were saying. So see, I, right. I got I got that. I got that one back. There. You like that, Greg? Hold that one back. There. That, was, that was a relatively. That was a fair recovery. I'm yeah, say. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you you're, pretty much, you're pretty much been going three different uh, places with your swing on this uh, podcast. I think Paul said you need two. So yeah, that, that was that was called the big that myth. Was, that, was that was a big myth. That was a big myth. But you recovered, and that's what's important. So Thank those you, are Paul. Great, great, great takeaways, Paul. I, I really appreciate um, just everything that came out of that conversation. And I think this is one of my favorite. Um, you're definitely one of my favorite people. So thanks for spending the time today with us, man. And um, I look forward to a lot more conversations with you. Absolutely. Thanks to both of y'all. Appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. See you, Paul. Bye.